The new president, George H.W. Bush, keeps the CIA in the Afghan game. But Bush's attention is quickly monopolized by the fall of the Berlin Wall, the crisis in the Soviet Union itself, and later, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Afghanistan fades rapidly from American concern. We had had discussions with the Soviets about how to handle Afghanistan, and we generally agreed that we didn't want anybody to have an advantage. Well, the Soviets had huge arms depots already in Afghanistan. And so what we were trying to do is simply keep a balance there uh, between the pro-Soviet and anti-Soviet forces in the region. The U.S. always had a very cynical, self-interested view of what it was trying to accomplish in Afghanistan. Namely, it was not there to help the Afghan people, whatever the rhetoric might have been. It was there to punish the Soviet Union and deter them from further aggression against U.S. interests. The Mujahideen take Kabul in April 1992. The former communist leader seeks refuge in the United Nations compound. Several Mujahideen militias seize the city. I was there in the city at the time, and they were initially greeted by flowers and applause. They took up positions around the city, and what became plain by the end of the day was that, yes, they had taken Kabul, but now they were going to turn and fight each other for true control of the city. The next morning, the next phase of the Civil War begins. The artillery fire is ferocious. Whole neighborhoods of the capital are reduced to rubble. For the next two years, war will continue sporadically, and there will be no coherent government in Afghanistan. Lawlessness and chaos rule. The world pays little attention a dangerous new group is about to step into the breach. The standard line out of Washington in the early 1990s became, the Afghans have to settle things for themselves. We can't settle their war for them. And that became a kind of an excuse behind which American policy withdrew. Out of this chaos and misery and international neglect, a movement emerges. It is mostly young men, refugees, students in the religious schools of Pakistan. They are Talibs, students, and they call themselves the Taliban. This group of religious teachers and students would never have been able to form a powerful political, let alone military movement, if they had not also received support from important groups in Pakistan. The Taliban start small. They confront local warlords in Afghanistan's south, home to the Pashtun minority. They use violence swiftly and effectively. They do not shy from executing or maiming thieves and drug dealers. Word of their success spreads, and many rally to their side. The Taliban were being feted and celebrated across Afghanistan because at that point, no one knew their ideology. Afghans were largely delighted that they had been absolved. The Afghans were tired of war. They wanted quiet, they wanted security, and the Taliban was able to give the Afghans that. They are led by a young and obscure village mullah named Omar. The title mullah indicates that he is a holy man. And Mullah Omar is a holy man who clings to a rigid and conservative understanding of Islam. Omar believes that true Muslims should live as the Prophet Muhammad did in the 7th century. Omar tells those around him that he was visited in a dream by Allah in the form of a man who told him to lead the believers. <laughs> 